Okay. Welcome everybody. On behalf of Arcadis, the American Flood Coalition and the Netherlands Embassy in Washington DC, I want to welcome you to the webinar Climate Resilient Watershed Approaches for Urban Communities in Florida and the Netherlands. My name is Saskia Pardans and I'll be your host today. Florida has more in common with the Netherlands than one might think. It may, but it may not be the first statement that comes to mind when we talk about flood control, but when it comes to river basin management in the Netherlands, watershed planning in Florida, the interplay between various interventions and skills as water governance, there's clearly more in common that might appear at first sight. During this interactive session, we are not going to talk about success stories. The goal is to learn from each other in case of extreme weather events. How do we plan for or respond to the extreme? Where do we need to improve? And what's currently happening to drive improvements? We'll start with the keynote from Miami-Dade County. Then we take a look at Florida and how they deal with the extreme. And after that, we learn more about the Netherlands and their experience during the summer flooding. At the end of the webinar, we'll have time for a Q&A, feedback, and the next steps. But before we dive deeper into the topic of today, I first want to tell you something about the collaboration between Arcadis, the American Flood Coalition, and the Netherlands Embassy. So I would like to see the next slide, please. And another slide. Since we have been record-breaking hurricane seasons and spring flooding in the last years, communities of all size are in need of new tools and strategies to prepare for future flooding and sea level rise. While national news often highlights the projects and solutions underway in large cities like New York, Boston or Miami, we know that smaller communities have a similar need to build resilience to flooding and sea level rise. In fact, the only way this country, and I'm not talking about the United States, will be truly, truly resilient is if we can find, scale, and finance solutions that sm protect small, rural, and poor communities with the same intentions that we give to the well-resourced cities. And that's why we partnered with the American Flood Coalition and Argatus to design the guide, Adaptation for All, How to Build Flood Resilience for Communities of Every Size. Next slide, please. The guide will help answer the critically important questions where to start building resilience. This guide covers 26 approaches to addressing land use and policy, stormwater and drainage, coastal and shoreline from communities, both large and small, both from the Netherlands and the United States. We have been breaking out approaches by cost and complexity so that local leaders can assess what's needed to implement these approaches. And there are learnings that any city can take from the examples outlined in this guide. And we hope that they serve as a jumping off point for local leaders looking to build a resilient future for they, their community. And by using simple rather than technical language, the guide is designed as a resource that local leaders can use and share broadly during community-based planning processes. By com combining the shared experience of Dutch and American resilience experts into practical approaches for smaller communities, we hope to include more communities into the discussion about turning flood risk into opportunities to shape their futures as places to go home. In the chat, you'll find a QR code where you can scan, uh, you can scan it, and then you'll get the adaptation for all guides. This guide is also the, the background for the approach we choose for this webinar. We are going to learn from experts from Florida and the Netherlands how they deal with extreme weather. We are very happy and honored that Mayor Daniela Levine Cava of Miami-Dade County would be our keynote speaker. Unfortunately, she can't make it because she's very busy at COP26. Luckily, she found a very good replacement, Jim Morley. He is the Chief Resilience Officer of Miami-Dade County, and he will talk about the challenges that Miami-Dade County is facing and the collaboration with the Netherlands. Jim, the floor is yours. I think we're all waiting for 
Jim. There he is. Should I continue because I don't see any. I think it's very, I didn't, I think you didn't hear Jim speak. Maybe at a later moment we can hear his uh, keynote. And I'm looking at the organization right now. Can we go on with Alex? Oh, I hear some sounds right now. Okay, I think we go on with Alex Reed. Uh, she's our next speaker, and she's the director of the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection at the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Alex, I don't want to give you the floor, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for this opportunity today. Um, it really is exciting to be able to partner with the Netherlands um, and compare some of our successes and, and uh, work together on some of the challenges. Um, you know, the, the term resilience is fairly new, uh, certainly within my vocabulary. Um, but just like the Netherlands, the state of Florida has been managing coastlines for decades through a variety of different programs, even though we may not have used uh, the word resilience, that's exactly what it was. So um, in Florida, we have an aquatic preserve program and a research reserve uh, program that focuses on managing biological resources and our coastlines, our natural coastlines, uh, so they can add that protective barrier to the state. Uh, we've also been managing our beach, uh, beaches statewide. Uh, we've got 825 miles of sandy shoreline as, as that first line of defense. Uh, managing those beaches and, and creating healthy beaches and healthy dunes um, have certainly been a, a main focus uh, and of not only our attention, but over a billion dollars over the past couple of decades. Um, we've also been focusing on uh, Florida's coral reef, uh, certainly a protective barrier in the southeast coast of Florida. And then, of course, our storm response efforts are, are statewide and they are pretty expansive so that we can help um, our communities recover when we do have impacts from hurricanes. But it's really only in the past couple of years that we've the term resilience has really grown on the state level. Um, you know, where we've been looking at how we can help our communities to plan for and adapt to the challenges um, of, of sea level rise and climate change and the potential for increasingly severe storm events. Up until now, all of that effort has really been led at the local level. So uh, certainly Jim Murley and, and the Miami-Dade folks have been phenomenal stewards of this effort, as well as some of the other larger communities like Broward County and the Tampa Bay area. Uh, so really, it's it's an honor for the state to be able to step up and, and bring that statewide perspective and provide support uh, to our community statewide. And really, the, the shifting point was a couple of years ago when our uh, Governor DeSantis came into office. Um, just on his second day, he came in with a very strong um, uh, policy shift on the environmental side and signed an executive order that uh, changed a lot of water quality parameters, environmental protections. And in that executive order, he not only created our office, but he also, uh, next slide, please, sorry, passed over that. 
Thank you. Um, not only did he create our office, the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection, by focusing all those coastal programs into one division, uh, but he also created um, the uh, Chief Resilience Officer, the first statewide Chief Resilience Officer, so that we could start focusing our efforts statewide and helping our communities. Um, and then another uh, really important um, act of this um, executive order was to also create the first chief science officer. And this position is uh, helping the department to make sure that whenever we make policy decisions, we're using good science as the background for those decisions. So it's been a very exciting year. Uh, next slide, please. So our first program that started uh, focusing on resilience statewide was the Florida Coastline, Resilient Coastlines Program. And this was really the state, the first statewide voice that created both technical support and guidance documents for our communities, uh, provided a grant funding opportunity, and it also provided a statewide forum where quarterly um, resilience practitioners could get together, talk about the challenges, talk about their successes, talk about the needs, and provide one another support for their planning efforts. Uh, since this started in late 2018, uh, we've been able to help about 129 communities um, with their planning efforts and then some small um, implementation projects as well. But this program was limited to just our coastal counties. So that excluded a lot of counties that had some flooding and sea level rise challenges um, that we just couldn't help until this time. Next slide, please. And then in 2020, um, a new piece of legislation passed our legislature um, that required that state financed constructors building within the coastal building zone would be required to complete a sea level impact projection study before they could be begin construction. And what that means is uh, the state wanted to make sure that if we were investing state dollars, that a local community using those dollars was planning for uh, sea level impact for either 50 years or the design life of the project, whichever is less. And as we all know, when you when you require a study um, of your communities, it can be uh, an administrative burden, it can be a financial burden, and that was the last thing we wanted to do. We wanted to make this an educational opportunity for our communities. So the department, together with our contractor, created a web-based application that would comply with all of the, the necessary requirements of the statute, but also be a, a learning source, a um, repository of adaptation ideas uh, that the state could use uh, for planning better as they move forward. Next slide, please. So we wanted to use um, uh, federal data sets uh, that were, you know, you know, recognized nationwide. So we used uh, information from NOAA and from FEMA, our emergency management agency. Uh, we used the, the state building code information and created a web-based application uh, where you can drill down to the parcel level. Uh, you can look at sea level rise projections. You can look at storm surge projections. You can look at um, high tide flooding events uh, within your area. Um, and with a click of a, and with the addition of seven different um, uh, project parameters, such as location, type of project, design life, uh, finished floor elevation, you can click a button and complete the obligations of statute, have a report to, to work with your community and plan for a, a stronger, more resilient project. Now there was one, there's one real limitation with this regulatory obligation or this obligation is that it's non-regulatory. It's more informational. And, and one of the challenges with that is um, we're getting communities to start the conversation but we're not necessarily driving change. So um, the next legislative session, uh, next slide please, brought about the Resilient Florida program. Uh, so this was just enacted earlier this year, a few months ago, um, and this legislation started on, on four basic concepts. Number one, it says that, you know, it acknowledges at the statewide level that we do have a challenge with sea level rise and climate change and the potential for increasingly severe storm events. And it also says that we need to prioritize our state funding to help our communities to plan for and adapt to these challenges. It also gets us thinking that it's not just a coastal issue anymore. This is a statewide issue. 
we have inland flooding challenges and we have inland challenges with um, increasing precipitation and storm events. And then it also says that, that in order for us to be really successful, we need to look at the entire state and we need to prioritize all of our critical assets and make sure that we're getting our state investment, our state dollars to those most critical assets and regionally significant assets. Next slide, please. So the, 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 there are about five components to this legislation that are pretty important. And number one, it creates the Resilient Florida Grant Program. Uh, this allows us to provide grants and aids to our community for their planning efforts. Um, and what was, was really helpful about this is it sets standards for our vulnerability assessment. So moving forward, we're, we have communities that are, that are basically judging their critical assets on the same standard. Um, it also does allow us to provide grants and aids for implementation projects, and that's going to be pretty important, and I'll circle back to that in a few slides. Next slide, please. One of the other key components is the requirement that the department develop a statewide vulnerability data set and assessment. Now, what's critical about this is, is ensuring that we're looking at all of the critical assets statewide, all of the forcing data that we would need for modeling, such as what sea level rise projections will we use, what planning horizons will we use, what um, anticipated uh, precipitation or heat indexes we'll use. And then we use all of that data to then create a statewide vulnerability assessment. So we know where all those assets are, and then we know we can prioritize uh, the most vulnerable based on this statewide assessment. So we're looking at needing to complete the, the data set um, by the end of this fiscal year, so July 1. And then the following year, the statewide assessment is due July 1 of 2023. So a, a big challenge in getting that completed um, statewide. Next slide, please. The third key component is the creation of the resilient, um, resilience plan. And this is a three-year rolling plan of prioritized projects uh, that will be funded um, for, from the state. Uh, the, the legislation contemplates that we'll appropriate $100 million annually uh, for this program, but based on the need that we've seen um, demonstrated thus far, I would imagine that those, that number will climb. Um, the year one and year two, um, this resilience plan will be based on existing vulnerability assessments already completed. And then once we have that statewide vulnerability assessment, the resilience plan will be based on that document. Um, it does require a 50-50 cost share unless there's a financially disadvantaged community. Next slide, please. The legislature also contemplates um, the potential funding for regional resilience entities. We know that our communities work stronger when they work together. And we know that some communities are further along in their planning efforts than others. So we want the regional collaboratives to work with one another and bring everyone up to the same level. Next slide, please. And this is a fun component to the legislation. It creates the Florida Flood Hub for applied research and innovation. And this is going to be our brain trust. This is going to be the group that's going to help us to determine where the state needs to move forward so that we can anticipate the future changes. So we're excited to work with um, the um, University of South Florida. Next slide, please. And then you can't have impactful change unless you pair strong policy with strong financial commitment. So uh, within this, um, when this legislation was passed, it came with an appropriation bill that was pretty, pretty phenomenal for a brand new, new program. Um, we will receive $20 million uh, to provide communities with uh, planning grants. Um, there is another $500 million appropriated uh, with COVID um, stimulus funding uh, for adaptation projects statewide. Uh, $4 million was provided to the department to work with contractors to make sure that we can get that data set and that assessment moving forward in a timely manner. Uh, the yellow column, you'll see that's the resilience plan. Um, there was no appropriation this year because we have not completed the first prioritized list yet but we do anticipate up to 100 million uh, next year once we provide that prioritized list to the legislature. 
And then we did receive $2 million to help those regional resilience entities uh, work together with their communities to help them with their planning and technical support. The Florida Flood Hub will likely receive funding from that $4 million pot because we, we will need them to help us with that data set and that assessment. So it was wonderful financial support. We opened a portal to accept grant applications. Um, December, September 1, the portal closed and we had 594 applications totaling $2.6 billion. So the biggest challenge with this program is, is not that we don't have strong policy and, and significant funding, but is it enough? And, and as you all know, um, this type of funding is, is a lot, um, but it's not a lot when you look at statewide uh, infrastructure and needs. So uh, we're hoping this is just the beginning and that the program will move forward and have strong support from our legislature. And um, that's, uh, next slide please. And if you have any questions, uh, my email address is there. You can also call me. Um, but it's going to be an exciting year, and we're looking forward to working with communities within the state of Florida. So thank you. Well, Alex, thank you so much for your inspiring presentation. And there is definitely enough to do uh, in Florida, that's for sure. And I can imagine there will be some questions also during the Q&A. And as Alex has given us some insight on federal perspectives on climate action, uh, Catherine Hagman will tell us more about the county and regional urban perspectives. And Catherine Hagman is the Resilience Program Manager of Adaptation within the Office of Resilience at Miami-Dade County. Uh, thanks, Catherine, for your interest of, for being here. And uh, well, the floor is yours. Thank you guys so much for having me. And I'm going to try and pull up my presentation. Hopefully uh, it works without any hitches. But thank you again so much uh, for having me. I am the program manager for adaptation in Miami-Dade County. Um, hopefully you all can can see the screen. Just yeah. let me know, Saskia, if you can see it. Yes, it looks good. Great, fantastic. OK, so I, I'll provide a, a little bit more of a, a local perspective on our flood risk challenges. So in adaptation in our context uh, overwhelmingly means adapting to sea level rise, which is our largest challenge. Um, so our sea level rise strategy is the guiding framework I'll talk more about later on. Um, but it's really informed by our landscape. We have different typologies or different landscape types throughout the county and that's essentially the the overarching framework for our adaptation approach this map on the left hand side shows you these these different areas that we have with our islands, our areas of high ground. And then what I'll talk primarily about is um, this area to the west, uh, which is along the Everglades. So obviously, well, I should say uh, most people when they think about Miami, they think about the beaches and the Atlantic coast that we have. And obviously that's an important part of our community. But we have in essence two coasts. We have the the far the eastern side that faces the Atlantic, but then we also have in some ways a second coast, which you can see here with the Everglades uh, to our west. And um, the Everglades, for those that aren't familiar, is a very large ecosystem, globally unique um, species, and and tremendous biodiversity. But it's also uh, very wet <laughs> and um, you can see here it's a, a very large area. A lot of work has gone into restoring um, the Everglades. That's where our, our focus is right now. Um, but it wasn't always the case. Historically, um, there was uh, a perception that this large expanse of, uh, of swampland should be uh, uh, transformed. So one of the challenges of development in Florida, uh, Florida has developed relatively recently, and before um, large-scale engineering, one of the challenges was our area receives a tremendous amount of rain in the rainy season. Last year in our area, we received almost uh, 100 inches or two and a half meters of rain last year. And it can come in, in heavy downpours or with tropical events um, and and leads to leads to flooding you know that's part of the ecosystem and again before we had large-scale urbanization it wasn't um you know it wasn't a problem it's, it's how the landscape has developed this sort of large-scale shallow uh swamp which is um very rich in terms of species and 
fish and birds and, and other things, but to our um, ancestors, there was also a concern that this, this flooding was inhibiting um, development. One of the things that's also counterintuitive is that although there's an abundance of water and an abundance especially in the rainy season, in the dry season, there's also the risk of fire. There were also droughts that devastated early agricultural um, efforts. And so our ancestors, you know, the folks that came before us were working, uh, created a large scale engineering project to attempt, attempt to drain the Everglades and other wetlands in Florida through channelization, creating drainage canals and um, brought the groundwater level down uh, several feet to facilitate development. You can see in some cases straightening meandering rivers um, and, and this was intended to help facilitate agriculture but also to create you know land for homes and housing and, and um, redevelopment. And so we've inherited a really large scale water management system throughout South Florida. Um, you can see here some of the canals, but there's a very active system of moving water back and forth between different water management areas, between the urban areas to try and manage flooding. And this includes in our, um, in our, what we think of as natural areas as well. Uh, so through that large scale engineering project, uh, the peninsula of Florida did have a large expanse of wetlands and the water flowed south through Okeechobee, but uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and others created a network of channels, drainage canals, control structure, water management control structures to try and manage that flow uh, to reduce, if you look at the southeast portion of the of um, southeast Florida, Miami is down here in the corner. And traditionally, before this large scale engineering, the water would sometimes flow through what is today the city, um, creating substantial flooding. But through the engineering um, and water management system, that land was reclaimed uh, for, and now we have a very, a lot of people that live um, out west here. Part of the reclamation process is still ongoing, where we mine material from the western areas and then place that material or fill in the wetland areas to create this type of development and then in the inter in the space between we have uh, stormwater management so ponds and and other features that are meant to hold a certain design storm of rain a certain amount of rain like the 25 year storm or um or or typically the 25 year storm but it means that a lot of the city or sort of i'll say city but i mean the urban area took landscapes that looked like this and and now they look more like this and so one of the big challenges that we have is that we have an area of high ground we call it the ridge even though it's only about 10 to 14 feet above sea level um, but then to the west of it inland of that we have a pretty wide expansive flat and low floodplain and in some cases it's just a few feet above the water table as those new communities are built they're designed to be above the water table but our water table is changing one of the other challenges that we have here is that the water that we drink comes from just underneath the city. And so um, in order to maintain that water as fresh, this is the Biscayne Aquifer, there has to be a certain differential. The water has to be higher on the west to push against the salt water that's on the east to maintain that freshwater pressure and so to avoid salt water intruding into the landscape. So one of the challenges of, of managing the flood risk, it, it would be intuitive to try and draw down the canal levels and the groundwater in those areas. But are constrained uh, by one, one constraint is that we have to try and maintain freshwater um, pressure and, uh, on that aquifer. Another constraint, as I mentioned, is that there's a large scale effort to restore the Everglades and that restoration requires having a lot of water out west. But as we think about the challenge of adapting to sea level, we can see that this is the map of the topography of the county and these islands of brown and red are the high ground. And then the blue are these low lying areas. And so many of the areas to the west are vulnerable to sea level, um, just as we have on the east. But the challenge of uh, reducing flood risk in those areas is much harder. Um, one of the other sobering aspects of sea level rise in Miami is that almost regardless of our emissions scenario, uh, we see substantial impacts to Miami. And obviously, these could take um, 
uh, well over 100 years or, or longer, but whether it's um, we keep to a 1.5 degree C emissions pathway, you can see all the areas in blue uh, would still be below what the expected sea level is. Even with the amount of carbon that we've locked in, uh, we still see substantial impacts. So the sea level rise strategy uh, is taking that uh, landscape as the foundation and to try and think about how we adapt to the flood risks that we see across the landscape because the challenge that we have along our ocean and beaches, as I say, is quite distinct from the challenge that we have in our western inland areas. Um, so the challenge for the western inland areas is that we really have water on all sides. We, of course, have the coast, uh, the saltwater intrusion and sea level rise, but we also need to manage uh, quite a bit of a rainfall every year and as well the groundwater table uh, changes. So in South Florida we have a highly permeable substrate, a karst uh, substrate, so we can't use the same adaptation measures that are used in the Netherlands or in New Orleans to essentially wall off the uh, urban areas from that intrusion because of the porosity and of our ground, the water, the groundwater just seeps up and kind of finds its own level on either side of such a wall. So our adaptation strategy, our sea level rise strategy is based on five adaptation approaches and they build quite a bit on the history of development that we have down here. One of which is to build on fill, although that has some obvious downsides. Another approach is to build up above the water uh, to allow um, things to safely flood to concentrate our development in the future along transit and on the higher ground. And then most importantly, to expand our greenways and blueways and, um, and also find space for green and blue infrastructure within our neighborhoods as well. So our challenge is to first <laughs> to accommodate the two feet of sea level that we're expecting over the next 40 years. And, um, and this is a challenge on our coast, but as I say, on the inland areas, it's even more difficult. The groundwater is very close to the surface and, and the large scale drainage project was able to bring the groundwater down several feet. But with sea level, uh, the canal levels are no longer able to drain. And so the groundwater is quite close to the surface. That means that we have a limited ability to absorb the rain in an unsaturated zone. And one of the things that makes this even more challenging is that very few people are aware of what the groundwater depth is. Um, so, you know, this is a change that is largely out of sight and out of mind. But for our farmers, for example, when the groundwater table gets too close to the surface, you know, they're very attuned to this issue. We've had instances where the um, high groundwater table has meant that the rains that do fall or lead to ruined crops. Of course, in our urban areas, we can see in some cases, this is some of the flooding we saw last year. One of the big challenges is that our canal levels are, are, are very high. And you can see there's, in this example of Little River, there's no real capacity to add more uh, fresh water to these canals. These are drained by um, gravity and and their tail water, the end uh, elevation, is governed by the tides. And as those tides rise, you know, we have a limited ability to, to enhance the amount of storage or discharge of fresh water that comes in here. And that's important for the inland communities because as we saw during the rainstorms that we had last year, when a heavy amount of rain falls to those western areas, it can take quite a long time, a very slow process, for those rains to drain through the canal system, uh, which is already very strained uh, by climate change and, and sea level rise. And this is also reminiscent of the historic floods, which um, before they had the drainage system could last um, months um, during the wet season. So last year we had quite a bit of flooding and you can see uh, some of the pictures here but um, we have a, a kind of very tough challenge to think about how we can manage uh, the flooding risk that is rising for these areas on the western end. Part of what we can do is change the way we manage the, the canal system and the water management system. But one of the things that's important is that originally when that was ent entity was created, it was created as a flood control district and its goal was very clear, it was to reduce flooding. But in the 70s, as part of sort of growing awareness of other needs, um, the 
the name was changed to the Water Management District, which is important because they have to manage several things simultaneously that are in some ways at odds with each other. So for example, we have had in Florida recently uh, quite, a, quite a number of water quality issues with algal blooms, red tide, fish kills that were due to low oxygen levels and high nutrient levels in our waterways. So while, again, another intuitive response to increasing flood risk would be to increase the discharge from the canals with pumps or other measures, those come with a, with a very real trade-off in water quality. Um, so, and of course, water quality is essential to our life and economy down here, which is really based on tourism and the water. So the Water Management District and, and, and us have a very tough um, balance to strike of thinking about how to manage these risks. The other thing that's very much on our minds in Southeast Florida is we have seen our neighbors um, throughout the Gulf Coast and Caribbean deal with tremendous amounts of uh, rain. So for example, Hurricane Dorian just missed us. Miami is right here. We missed the impacts of Hurricane Dorian, but it brought more than 36 inches of rain uh, to some of the islands that were most hard hit. And of course, we see with Houston and our neighbors in New Orleans this year, in our region, there's a potential for those large rain events to come dropping, in some cases, feet of rain. And we know that in our context, we don't have the capacity to absorb that or hold that. And so that would lead to that kind of event would lead to prolonged um, and extensive flooding. So we're grateful to have our Dutch colleagues <laughs> helping us navigate this and uh, uh, thankful to Arcadis and others who help us develop the sea level rise strategy and try and be proactive um, and do what we can ahead of those types of storms to try and manage that risk um, over time. So with that, I'll say thank you and, and pass it back to Saskia. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for your presentation. And I think there are a lot of Dutch people who don't know that Florida has canals as well, because of course, Amsterdam is famous for canals, but that Florida has it is very nice uh, to know. And of course, all the other information is also very interesting to learn about. And I hope we got a lot of questions for you as well during the Q&A. Uh, in the Netherlands, we still can learn a lot about emergency response. And Diederik Timmer is currently working as director of the province of Limburg. And a lot of it has happened there during the summer. So he will share his experiences and takeaways. So Diederik, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. I think someone is sharing the presentation for me. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to tell something about the recent flooding and the approach we have in the province of Limburg to work, to work towards a resilient system. Uh, my name is uh, Diederik Timmer. I'm, as uh, stated on the, on the slides, uh, Managing Director of the province of Limburg. And before that, I was working for the national government and uh, also working on flood protection. And on behalf of the, uh, the national government, I was also in the, uh, in the country of uh, a couple of uh, people in this uh, meeting now. I was, uh, I was working at New Orleans just after the aftermath of the Hurricane Katrina. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, I, uh, I draw up a table of contents. Um, at first, I will give you an overview, uh, overview of the region and the flooding in uh, the province of Limburg in the past history and the Dutch approach to flood protection. And afterwards, I will um, go into detail about the recent flooding in uh, July of this, uh, of this year and the way we work towards a resilient regional system. Next slide, please. As said, first an overview of, uh, of the system and the province of, uh, of Limburg. What you see is the catchment area of uh, the River Meuse, which has its source in uh, uh, yeah, south, of, uh, south of the Netherlands in the country of France and is flooding towards uh, uh, the area of Rotterdam and is, has its mouth in the North Sea. Uh, the River Meuse is, um, uh, is a large rain river about 900 kilometers long and it's stowed for transport by water. Can I have the next slide? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of um, unique characteristics of the River Meuse, but I like to point out now that it has a large decay. It's unique and terraced landscape 
and it has a lot of different functions like transport, agriculture, nature, and recreation. Next slide, please. High water in um, the province of Limburg, but also in the Netherlands, is of all times. Um, you can see here a slide of the high water in 1926 at the place of Gennep. Next, please. At Hoermond. Next, please. Next, please. Yes, and this is um, uh, this is the city of Venlo in the center of the province of Limburg. It's Christmas Eve, and uh, we had to ev evacuate uh, large parts of uh, of the Netherlands, and it was in 1993. Um, all these slides uh, yeah, make make sure that it's very important in the Netherlands to work on flood protection as in your country and uh, only in the province of Limburg we have 60,000 people at risk and a potential damage uh, per event of 3 billion euros. Next please. Flood protection in the Netherlands is um, more or less perhaps you know it is a combined approach we have the uh, flood protection by strengthening the water defenses, but we also facilitate extreme river discharges by the program, which is called in Dutch Room for the River. And this gives us the opportunity not only to work on flood protection, but also on spatial quality. So we have a combined approach on strengthening water defenses and giving room for the river. And uh, next, please. Yeah, a couple of examples what we are doing in the Netherlands and in my province now is we're working on uh, 34 places. It's pointed out on the map on the right. And we have recent investment by national and regional government only in Limburg of 1.5 billion on the different uh, measures we take along the river Meuse. Can I have the next? So this was what was in the past, but last year uh, in the summer, of uh, July 21, we had a, um, yeah, an extreme amount of rainfall in a short period of time, which led to flooding of uh, yeah, large parts of the Netherlands, uh, but also in Germany and Belgium. Can you have the next? Next, please. Yeah. Well, this was quite fast. <laughs> this is quite fast. Can, I, can you go back one? <laughs> Yeah, what you see here is a, um, a destroyed rail bridge in the uh, in Altenar in Germany, and the next you see a picture of the Pinster in Belgium after the flooding of a small regional river. Next, please. Yeah, some facts and figures. I think it's important. Uh, what we saw, it was um, we had yeah, in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands about yeah, 200 casualties in the recent summer, and uh, we had uh, an amount of estimated damage of about tens of billions of euros, and that was not only in um, uh, the main system of the River Meuse, but it was uh, yeah, more in uh, the side streams and the regional systems. And that was for us um, a yeah, very, um, yeah, very important warning that we not only should work in the Netherlands on the main systems, but also we should work on the uh, regional systems and make that resilient as well. Next, please. Yeah, this were, uh, these are some pictures from, uh, from last summer, but not, uh, not in Europe, but uh, in Limburg itself. This is the city of uh, Falkenburg. Uh, which was flooded extremely and had a, lo a lot of damage, about 400, billion, uh, 400 million only for the city of, uh, of Falkenburg, and it was due to the extreme discharge and the high water in the, um, in the side streams. Next, please. Yeah, it's another picture of the city of Falkenburg. Yeah, these are the large discharges at the River Meuse. Next, please. And next, yeah. 
Also, a couple of numbers. We had extreme rainfall in the, in the amount of uh, 80 to 180 millimeters within uh, 48 hours. We had extreme river discharges and it was in summertime. And that was um, normally it happens in the Netherlands uh, more or less in, uh, in autumn or in winter time. But now it was in summertime. What we saw is uh, apart from the damage of 1.8 billion, we also had to evacuate uh, tens of thousands of people in the in the cities of Maastricht and uh, and Venlo. So it was uh, it was a large event with a, a lot of consequences. Next, please. Yeah. Um, when this happened, um, the national government made it for the Netherlands a national disaster. A lot of yeah, important people came to this region, the royal family, which you see here in the picture on the left and in the middle, uh, the king's commissioner, uh, but also the prime min uh, minister and members of parliament all visited the area. And after they visited the area, they decided to declare it a national disaster. And why was that important? Um, yeah, normally you don't want to be a national disaster, but when it happens, uh, in the Netherlands, it's uh, it's important because um, you can have then uh, yeah uh, the damage compensated by uh, commercial insurance companies, but also by the Disaster Compensation Act, which uh, comes in place. Then, next, please. This is another picture of the royal family. Next, please. Yeah, and now I think I'm come to the um, yeah. A more important uh, part of this presentation. Um, we were a national, um, a national disaster. We had a large event with a lot of casualties and a lot of damage. But the question is, what can we do? And what we see in the Netherlands that we are, I think, um, quite well organized on um, flood protection on the main system, but we're not so well organized on working on uh, the secondary system or the the, the small uh, the small streams. So we ask ourselves, what can we do? And uh, tomorrow we are presenting our plan to uh, to the national government in the city of uh, The Hague to uh, to the Minister of uh, uh, of Infrastructure and Water and Water. We have an um, uh, we have an um, uh, five measurements which um, which we think are uh, necessary to uh, take action towards a resilient and climate-proof water system. The first one is evaluation. Know what has happened. River-based analysis and crisis evaluation. The second thing is a, a term I think you use in your country as well, but it's building back better. What we like to do is uh, to use the amount of 1.8 billion, which is um, yeah, funded as a damage compensation. We like to use it effectively by uh, using that amount of money to reinvest in uh, in sensible measures. The third thing we like to do is uh, accelerate existing measures in the main and in the regional system. And the fourth is adapt and uh, make new additional me measures with spatial planning as a guiding principle. What is also very important is that we not only look, and I just said it, but not only look at the main system of the river Meuse, but also look at the, the, the small side streams and combine them in a, um, in a coherent approach between main system and secondary system. Next, please. Yeah, what to do next? Um, I was talking about uh, the difference in uh, main system and uh, regional system and what we, um, what we like to do in the regional system because there is not a lot of emphasis on the regional system in the Netherlands is uh, six type of measures and I have some pictures of it later on the next uh, slide, but um, I first um, I first uh, elaborate on it uh, on the on those uh, here. Uh, what we think is necessary is adaptation of crops, um, different farming met methods in rural areas. It's necessary for the south of Limburg. We think it's necessary to reduce the hardened surface in the urban areas. There were some pictures in the previous presentations from other uh, uh, other speakers. We think it's necessary to create rainwater catchment areas, self-reliant citizens, spatial planning based on risk analysis, and very important, um, 
uh, even for the province of uh, of Limburg, because we are our borders are at uh, Germany and and Belgium, international cooperation. I have some examples on the next slide. What you see here is uh, measurements in the um, in the rural area. Next, please. The, what you see here is a small uh, combined um, uh, uh, catchment area where we combine catchment with uh, rural activi activities and farming methods. Next, please. Yeah, here we saw already a couple of slides, but these are the measurements we are uh, taking into place in the uh, in the urban areas. Next, please. Another example of in the urban areas. Next, please. Yeah, and this is very important also that you not only see the, the large measures in um, in the cities, but that, uh, that citizens do things in uh, at their own home um, uh, also, like uh, uh, increase uh, infiltration. And next, please. And take measures when uh, this is an example of an uh, of a simple flood barrier at uh, at the home of a person, which we uh, put in place in uh, in the hills in uh, in the south of Limburg. Next, please. I was talking about um, um, adaptation in the re uh, regional system. What we can do also is uh, on the main system. We saw that measures we've taken in the main system were already highly effective. But nevertheless, we think that uh, in this situation of uh, past July, which was very extreme and uh, therefore critical, we should um, yeah, take some additional measures in a certain weak spot at the city of Venlo, Roermond and Maastricht. And we take these measures on uh, yeah, risk-based analysis. Next, please. I think this is for the discussion later on, but uh, challenges for the future. I think that um, I gave an example of um, yeah of flooding in the um, yeah in the past decades in the province of Limburg, but in the Netherlands also. I think I could tell you about the combined approach we have by strengthening water defenses, but also uh, giving room for the river. But what you see in the Netherlands is that we um, that we have an emphasis on the on the main system. In the main system, it's all um, uh, there is also legislation. But in the regional small systems, which we had uh, seen last uh, last summer, we had uh, a large amount of damage, but also casualties in uh, throughout Europe. And I think it's very very necessary to have the um, the thing we have on the main system to export the knowledge and uh, the structural approach also to the secondary system, and so we can work towards a resilient system. That resilient system, I think it's. Um, it's not only technical measures, but we need to um, address other things in an integral and an adaptive approach. And it takes measures not only in the rural and urban areas, but also self-reliant citizens, spatial planning and risk analysis. Thank you. Well, Diederik, thank you so much for your insight. And yeah, when all the measures are taking place, let's hope it's go not going to happen again. Um, I think we'll have some interesting, I already saw some questions in the Q&A and you already have some discussions points going on. So let's talk on later uh, during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Our final speaker of today is Ed Anker. Ed is Vice Mayor of Swolle with spatial planning, water and climate adaptation in his portfolio. And Ed, I think you're going to tell something about how your city also was impacted by floods. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Saskia. And uh, great to be here and to hear all these different stories from uh, the other side of the world, the other side of the great ocean and uh, our own uh, province of Limburg, of course. Um, is my presentation starting at some point? Because I don't think everybody knows where Swolle is, <laughs> is situated in the Netherlands. Right. Uh, the blue dot, that's Swolle. And it's also uh, a great color because uh, uh, our city is a blue-white city. Uh, so everything in our style is blue and white. Uh, and we're also a very blue city because we have a lot of water in our city. But we are a regional city in the east of the Netherlands. Um, and 
are uh, the, the the story about the Meuse is a story of a, a very big river. And as you can see in our next slide, you will see that Swolle is surrounded by smaller rivers. Oh, no, this is, oh, we also have some historic pictures. This is a very old picture of Swolle uh, of about 100 years ago. Uh, we are also a city used uh, 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 to uh, water problems, but we are also so a very uh, a city that uh, really had its economic development because of its situation uh, situation near uh, large rivers. Uh, we are a Hanseatic city. Maybe you've heard of it in the states, uh, but there uh, is a, a, a bond of European cities called the Hanseatic City Movement. And um, uh, for uh, hundreds of years ago, they uh, worked together in international trade. Uh, along the rivers. Next, please. Here you can see our rivers. Uh, our biggest river and most important river is the Isel, and we are. Uh, it's a river that also has uh, international connection with water from the Alps that streams through the Isel to the Isomere and later on to sea. But we also have a smaller river. You can see it. Uh, 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 in the, uh, up in the picture, it's called the Vecht. Uh, it's uh, an international river, but it's mainly a rainwater river, and uh, we share it with Germany. And then there's the river Zwarte Water, and that is, uh, uh, goes through our historic city center. And the thing is with um, uh, our back country is that we also have a system of small canals called the Solandse Weteringen, and all the rainwater from the hills around Zwolle they go through those canal, through our historic city center, to the Zwarte Water, and later on to the IJsselmeer. So it's quite a complicated water system. Next, please. For a, a, a few years ago, we uh, made our own climate adaptation strategy. And in the Netherlands, it's quite new policy, but in the Netherlands, a few years ago, all uh, municipalities were um, obliged to make uh, a climate adaptation strategy. So we are uh, obligated by law to do that. Uh, and in our uh, adaptation strategy, we discern three levels of um, uh, a strategy. First, there's the regional system. And it's very much like what you heard in the former presentation about Limburg. We have the main rivers, and we also have the uh, room for the river projects. We have just concluded them a few years ago. Uh, and uh, now there we are working on uh, reinforcing um, a program for the dikes around the city of Swolle. For all the rivers, three rivers, we have to strengthen the dikes um, because we keep on uh, make uh, new assessments on risks. And by those new risk assessments, we conclude, well, there is uh, the, the, uh, more strengthening is needed. So this is a very costly uh, operation, uh, only for the city of Swolle. Well, we don't have to pay it ourselves, luckily, but uh, for over a billion uh, euros is spent on water safety in our, in our regional system. And you also see in our system those um, uh, the collision between the primary system of the rivers and those regional uh, the regional system of the Weteringen. And it's typically for a Dutch city, but probably for more cities in the world that so a, pre, a, a primary system of main rivers or a sea or a big lake and a regional system, they collide at a place where a city is built in the past because that's also the place that's most interesting for trade, etc., cetera, uh, economic development. So this is a very common system, but we are now learning the last few years in the Netherlands to combine those problems more together. So this is our uh, regional approach, water robust Swolle. Then we have the urban approach, and the, we call this the green-blue network, also in Dutch the green-blue Casco, like a water casing around the city of Swolle. And that's when we zoom in on, on city level and see what are the places that we have to connect and where we have to create more room to uh, manage uh, big rain showers um, or, or uh, temperatures of uh, high uh, groundwater uh, um, situations. Um, so we want to make uh, the city as robust as uh, possible. And this is 
mostly uh, also a program with, with a longer term that when you see a chance to change something in your city that you take the blue approach with it and then there's our neighborhood uh, uh, level and this is uh, our neighborhood approach is maybe a little the well, probably the most ambitious uh, in the Netherlands uh, in in its smallness because uh, next please in our city uh, we say that everyone is a delta worker and i don't know how it's internationally but when you say in the netherlands that you want to give something very very special attention and make it really special then a delta plan is needed because we have the uh, delta works of course from the last century that were used to uh, protect the netherlands from the sea later on we have the room for the river projects but a delta plan our delta works this is our national pride these are big great projects but what we want to do is translate that way of thinking to streets to neighborhoods to backyards so with uh, maybe a little bit um, woo -ha, we say that everyone can be a delta worker because everybody holds a small piece of the solution uh, in a street and that eventually in our city because we don't uh, manage the backyards of people so here you see um, the small projects of um, uh, kids that are working in a, a square that we made green in the city and the second picture in the middle you see people talking about losing parking spaces for green places and uh, they are also making small gardens um, to the um, facades of the housing etc uh, there's also this innovation with those tubes that holds thousands of liters of water uh, so that somebody more than even a small cas casket can hold thousands of liters of water uh, against the wall and uh, the picture in the left and the uh, bottom uh, is a very stony area used to be a very stony area where neighbors together worked on making this garden and it are very small projects but we have well tens maybe hundreds of them already and square by square meter uh, we are making our city more like a sponge so this is something that is very important to us do the thing on the regional and the city level, but also on the street level. And perhaps Swale is not the biggest city of the Netherlands, of course. We have the size to uh, make this approach work. But we think it's very important that climate change shouldn't be just some task or a burden that we have to face, but it should also be a movement that enthuses people to, to work in their own streets. And we think that we succeed in it by this. Next, please. This is you know, hard to see, but uh, we also use our data um, to share with people and, and, and also to work with the collecting of the data. In the uh, uh, small picture, you see people working on a weather sensor. We are working with the Royal Dutch Meteorological Institute, the KNMI in Dutch, um, and uh, uh, a University of Wageningen to collect data in neighborhoods and people um, could register to place a, a rain sensor in their gardens. You Maybe you don't believe it, but there's actually a waiting list for those sensors. People want to join this experiment. Um, so this is a very a, a great success and we are, for a few years now we are collecting data to see what is happening with the climate in our city. Um, but we are also working on um, the wet feet map. And this is probably a, a little bit of a strange um, uh, sentence uh, in, in this presentation but in Dutch the not the footer card um, we also of course have our data based on modeling but what we want to uh, do is enrich those models with uh, real-time data from our citizens from inhabitants so when we ask people when there was a big rain uh, shower we ask them if they seen um, problems with uh, water flooding etc in the city and it can be very small on, on street level to um, report it to us so we can um, uh, uh, enrich our uh, models with real-time data and we don't have a picture of it uh, in this presentation but we also have a sweat drop map it's really something uh, <laughs> something special but when we have a heat wave in the Netherlands we want to ask people to uh, identify uh, heat islands in our cities with extreme heat 
so that we can also make those uh, uh, maps more valuable to us. And with that, we uh, actually managed to let people interact with well, our collecting of data and uh, the, the consciousness of and, uh, and the call to action to do something about climate change at a street level. Next, please. And for now, we have uh, a few more challenges because, as you will probably know, there's a, a big shortage of housing in the Netherlands and our region is very popular. A lot of people want to live here because of beautiful uh, landscape, etc., and the beautiful city of Swallow, of course. Um, but we have to build more houses in the Netherlands and we can't do it in the old way where we just uh, took uh, a, a green area and put in some uh, well, almost industrial-like uh, housing. Now we have to, uh, to develop and to um, um, uh, uh, design our housing uh, with climate change in our minds. So this is where we as a region had, have uh, got a special task from the national government for, um, uh, we are a Novi Gebied, well it's a Dutch, uh, um, uh, um, it's a Dutch term, so you probably won't know it, but we made a vision on uh, a national scale and some special challenges were given to special um, uh, areas. And we have this one, how do we uh, combine climate change uh, with uh, spatial development? Because we are very compact delta with all the problems, well, exactly like Miami-Dade, we have water from the sea, we have water from the river, we have water from uh, uh, groundwater, etc. We have all the five uh, challenges that you have as well, uh, because Isomere is, of course, connected with the sea level. Um, so we, um, we, we have all those problems, and in our compact delta, we can, um, well, uh, do research on, on how to face those challenges. Next, please. And this is one of our last things. Um, we this is a square, of course, for uh, in front of our historic station. Um, underneath the square, we have a big uh, garage for bicycles. It's a big thing, of course, in the Netherlands. Um, we have developed the uh, and and designed the complete square as a sponge with crates underneath the street surface to infiltrate rainwater. But we can also, in desperate times, use the garage for the bicycles uh, as a, uh, a casing area uh, in when there's a heavy rainfall. Of course, not all the bikes will be underwater. It's only a few centimeters, but it's a very large space. So, and, and when we, uh, just a few weeks ago, we opened the square and we celebrated with our children. And of course, the theme should be water. So we let all the children take jump in the new pond uh, in front of the station to uh, jump uh, as hard as possible. But we also want to educate our children and also the people of Swallow that this is a square that's also designed with climate change in our minds. I think that was my last slide, Saskia. Next, please. Yes, thank you for your time in Dutch. Okay, Ed, thank you so much for your presentation. And what we really got me is that you're working with communities and that's so important and not only here but also in the united states and that's also one of the reasons why the adaptation for all guide i talked about previously uh, is so important because we want to work with smaller communities to face the challenges of resilience so thank you for sharing that you're welcome now it's time to open the q a and uh, i can imagine there will be some questions edgar westerhoff and sabrina helmar from both from arcades will moderate this q a uh, and before I give them the floor, um, I would want, want to tell you that the presentations can and will be shared if, if you want to. And uh, the video from Jim from uh, Miami Dade County will be shared on the website because technically we cannot show it again. So it will be on the website and there you can see his, uh, his story. So again, thank you so much to all the speakers, uh, Edgar and Sabrina, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, wonderful. Well, maybe we take the opportunity to to go back to the to where we started in the session uh, to Florida. You know, I'm always intrigued and impressed by the scale of the challenges the state is uh, is facing, and also counties like Miami Dade. You know, there's a, a, a tremendous need. Um, and I see an interesting question in the chat, but maybe we go first to uh, what is being. Um, uh, or a question I have myself here, and that's, you know, how 
yeah, how Florida, I mean, you have to prioritize a lot of needs uh, within your state. And with the activities you are taking on yourself, like the vulnerability analysis, the assessment you are taking on, um, how do you prioritize these needs? You know, how do you balance the needs, for example, from uh, Broward County in the north to Tampa in the south uh, to Miami uh, Dade County in the middle? And um, how does that work Maybe politically, uh, technically? Can you elaborate on that, please? Absolutely, thank you. Um, great question. Um, so obviously the statewide data set is gonna help us identify those critical assets. Um, statewide assessment is gonna prioritize those for us. Um, there is a prioritization scheme uh, in the statute that helps us kind of narrow down how to prioritize the, the resilience plan or that prioritized list of projects that goes uh, to the legislature for funding consideration. Um, some of the, you know, basically the, the the prioritization scheme is based on um, things like the degree to which a proposed project will address the community-wide uh, critical infrastructure. So it's pretty relative. Uh, we'll go into a rulemaking effort to fle you know, flesh that out um, more substantially, especially when we have to compare projects that are across the board from living shorelines to uh, wastewater infrastructure to transportation to historic resources. You know, it's it's, it's a pretty wide ra range and it's going to be a challenge. But some of the components that are not as specific in the, the statute that I hope um, will grow through time is how do you prioritize urban versus rural? Rural. Um, how do you look at inland versus coastal? Um, how do you look at, at disadvantaged communities uh, more effectively? And then how do we prioritize statewide? You know, is, does there need to be a geographic distribution? So lots of things in play and we'll, we'll hopefully get some uh, answers when we go through the rulemaking effort or the administrative code process, uh, but hopefully there'll be changes in statute as well. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, beside the, you know, I would say that the internal state uh, processes, there's of course also uh, the federal play. I see a question here from Mr. Pete Dirke. How can Florida state make a political case to the federal government about its tremendous urban and coastal climate resilience needs. And I guess this question, yeah, relates to how, yeah, how Florida State compares to other uh, states that are uh, requesting uh, financial uh, support. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, I'm, I'm probably not a great authority on that. Um, I try to keep down at my level, but um, I think one of the positive things that came out of the past, uh, out of the COVID, the pandemic, was the federal funding support. And that's really the reason why we got that large um, appropriation, that $500 million appropriation. Um, and this funding was uh, provided to get communities back um, up and running after the COVID and address some of the um, economic challenges that we've had. Um, now, one of the, the caveats of, of that um, uh, stimulus funding was to make sure that we're um, addressing um, uh, our communities that have water challenge, water water related challenges, and so there's been a lot of latitude for us using that fund, uh, that funding to address uh, the climate change and sea level rise um, challenges that we have. And of course, the uh, Biden administration is very supportive of adaptation measures and and changing the way we we do things so that we can adapt. So it's a it's a really supportive environment um, on the federal side as well as the state side right now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sabrina. Yes. Um, perhaps also a, a question uh, for uh, Diederik Timmer because you were telling uh, in the Netherlands we have a big focus on the main system. And uh, what showed uh, the, the, the events of this summer showed that we should have also more um, uh, uh, spend more time and uh, consciousness on the uh, on the regional system. And I think that's also what Ed is ampli amplifying that we uh, should have more attention to the regional system. Um, my question to you would be: How do you see the role of the province? Because as Ed told us uh, all municipalities, if it's correct, uh, have made their own uh, climate adaptation plans. And what's the role then to, to make this switch to more attention to the regional system? What role can a province make uh, in that switch? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Sabrina. Um, yeah, at first, I think what we can learn from uh, the colleagues in um, in the United States is that um, uh, for the regional system and working towards a, re a really resilient regional system, 
you need a combination of measures. So it's not only technical measures, but it's a combination of funding. It's a combination of governance. It's a combination of prioritizing measures. It's a combination of technical and spatial uh, measures. So um, I think what I really uh, learned from the colleagues in, uh, in the United States is that a combination of measures works. When you are asking uh, what can a province do in that combination of measures, then I think um, the province now in the regional system uh, in the Netherlands is uh, responsible for uh, policy um, and uh, setting the safety standards. But only by policy and setting safety standards, that's not enough. We need structural funding. We need a governance structure together with the uh, local um, uh, local municipalities, but also with the, uh, the national government. We need structural funding. Um, and I think we need a combination between technical and uh, spatial. And in spatial, um, the local municipalities have an important role. So um, I think that uh, a role for the province should uh, combine those things and uh, bring parties together to make a truly resilient system in the Netherlands. Okay, thank you. And and then perhaps uh, going to, to Ed, um, if we ha would have a, a more uh, system like um, Diederik just um, describes, would that also help uh, the city of Zwolle? Yeah, absolutely. We're also working very closely with uh, our water board, Drenthe uh, Overijsselse Delta, and um, um, and with uh, the province of Overijssel. We are very uh, close uh, collaboration because, of course, the problems are for everyone, and everybody has its own role to play. So, in the urban areas, it's mostly province and. Uh, um, uh, as I said uh, correctly, uh, the, the water uh, board, um, when the, uh, we are in a city and we are developing housing, of course, it's uh, mainly uh, the city. Uh, we're all have, we all have uh, roles to play, so it's very important. And uh, as I said, our regional approach, Watra Busole, is an approach that we have made in collaboration with uh, those other governments. Um, and with more uh, also uh, other parties like um, uh, science, education, uh, etc. Um, because we have to uh, share our agendas and share our problems. So this is something uh, that from the bottom up up is done in the uh, in our area in Overijssel. But I know from the Netherlands that it's not everywhere uh, 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 as automatic as it is in in, in our uh, area. So absolutely, this is something that would make us more and more effective in the Netherlands, but also, of course, internationally, internationally, if we share our agenda and share our problems and make it a movement of everybody together. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps if we look at uh, Q&A, some questions um, are made, but I think most of them are already tackled, Edgar. Yeah, well, um, I do have uh, a question uh, for Katie, but also a question to uh, Mr. Ed Anker. Uh, I lived in Spol myself for many years, so I do have some questions on that. But maybe first, uh, Katie, I mean, you explained the strategy at large, you know, how Miami-Dade County uh, is working, you know, to, to address the next uh, few decades up to two feet of sea level rise, how that is going to influence um, the larger water system. But can you yeah, elaborate a little bit more on what planning for the extreme means for yeah, critical community assets. And with that, I mean like hospitals, uh, power supply, telecommunication. Uh, what are they doing and how yeah, are they anticipating, you know, the future climate extremes? Yeah, so I think one of the um, one of the challenges that we have is that we know that if we have a, an extreme event, uh, be it a, a storm surge from the coast or heavy rainfall, that we will certainly have flooding. So, and if we were to get a strong storm, um, we would have extensive and, and prolonged flooding. So we don't have the capability to completely remove that risk or even, um, so we are trying to sort of buy it down. Um, but our critical facilities are, um, you know, 
it's important for us to keep a, a sharp eye on those because we know how important they'll be to the recovery. We have a, um, a, a little bit of a divided governance structure. So for example, our electricity assets are controlled by a private company um, and they set their design standards um, and we try and collaborate, but it, it isn't always very easy. So I'll use an example. We control the water and sewer um, infrastructure. We have done a lot of research into a worst case scenario, a category five in the future, and then prioritizing how to protect those wastewater assets from um, from that, that flood depth. Um, and also to prioritize even within that system, which components are most important for maintaining the system to be able to convey, you know, which are most important for life safety. So even within our critical infrastructure systems, prioritizing the components and um, so quite a lot of work, but to use a real example, with our water and sewer assets, we're elevating them in some cases almost 10 feet above where they were previously. Um, but in some cases, the electricity that would supply that um, pump station is still at the same elevation because it's controlled by a different entity. So, you know, we are cognizant of that. And in many cases, we're able to um, elevate our generators, which is our backup power. Um, but it is a, um, kind of a large coordinated effort. Sometimes we have direct control and we can set science-based design standards and elevate accordingly, although funding is a big constraint. Um, but with hospitals or other private entities, it is a collaborative process of education and um, maybe a little bit of negotiation. But one of the main things that is fortunate about this year is that funding has been perhaps the largest limiting factor on retrofitting our existing infrastructure. So we've done a lot of vulnerability analysis and know what's at risk, but we haven't had the ability to fix it um, in all cases. So. We're hopeful and grateful to the state for making so much available this year, and hopefully we can um, start to protect it. But to your point, Edgar, absolutely part of dealing with the extremes is to prioritize those facilities, like our wastewater treatment plants, that if they were to go offline, our entire community really would be offline um, without, you know, without water or sewer, not much else can happen. So kind of triaging based on that. Yeah, very good. Well, it's, it's good to hear that also for uh, critical assets, there is a plan uh, in place. And well, maybe as a follow up to that, Mr. Anker, you know, life safety may not be, you know, the, the main concern for the city of Zwolle. Um, I think, you know, we, we tend to plan for uh, events or plan uh, for events that happened in the past. And, you know, I lived in Swallow many years myself, and of course I've noticed extreme rain events, but it seems that Swallow hasn't really experienced uh, an extreme event like we've seen with the flood disasters in, in Limburg. So how does Swallow, yeah, make sure that you are, you know, through programs like the Everyone is a Delta Worker, that you're on the right track? Are you doing enough to keep the city uh, away from future harm. And indeed, that's where life safety may come in. Yeah, thank you for the question, Edgar. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, uh, like we said, we are making our, uh, uh, using our models and also sharing them uh, with uh, the people in our city. And uh, we want to do everything. So this is why we have this regional and an urban and a neighborhood approach. Uh, and as when we can do something not so good uh, or just uh, let something lie and tell our citizens to uh, change the, the the way their backyard is uh, is decorated uh, we can't say to a street well we're making less parking spaces to put more green in there when we are neglecting uh, the, the the task that we have uh, on a city level so we have to do it on all fronts uh, as well and um Luckily, we don't have, uh, because last summer were a lot of rainstorms also in our neighborhood, uh, Dalsen, the place where Henk Ovink, I saw in a picture, is living uh, uh, right now, uh, had a, a real big storm, uh, Friesland, and of course Limburg. And uh, luckily, we didn't have any problems, but uh, also in the 90s, we had some problems uh, with the River Isol uh, and, and uh, a small flooding uh, in our city center. So, well, we 
so there's always urgency uh, and and by uh, using the data we show people uh, what happens in a, a case of an extreme storm they will can see on the map what happens to their house if the water is entering their garden if the water might enter their house so we uh, and we want to keep those um, uh, uh, models up to date of course and in uh, the coming weeks I'm talking about this plan well you, you won't be able to see it but it's a development uh, outside of the dikes in Swartavater in an old industrial area uh, and we took the, 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 the latest models of last summer and hided them with even uh, more uh, uh, so a water table for about with a with a meter so that well we're safe anyway even if the the, the next modeling and the next modeling and the next modeling will be worse than we have now um, that we will be safe okay thank you and um, also Sabrina, i would also have a question for uh, for Dietrich. maybe you wanna or do you have another another question what do we have in our q a no, I don't think we have uh, another question in the Q and A. So please uh, go ahead. Yeah. So um, you know, right after, and this is a question for Diederik or an observation. Uh, right after the flood disasters uh, past summer in Limburg, Germany, Belgium, you know, we heard in the news that you know we just experienced the future, and that of course made many people wonder. Well, if this was the future, what is the real future going to look like? Um, and so a question to you would be like, you know, how is Limburg reworking statistics to, yeah, to be ahead of the game? Yeah, that's a difficult question, Edgar, because I think that uh, the statistics on, um, on last summer and on the past events in the, uh, in the past years, are still um, are still being um, examined. So uh, what we agreed upon together with the national government is that, and it was in the first part of our approach, is that we um, really have um, uh, uh, really have to study on what happened, not only on the uh, physical parts or on the rainfall and on uh, how the system uh, did work, but also in how we uh, tackled in organizational way uh, uh, this crisis because. We had a lot, a lot of people working on um, on the River Meuse, but also in the uh, in the side streams to uh, to act during the crisis. So um, we are planning on evaluating just what you uh, were asking, and we expect the first results uh, within four months, and then uh, the definite results in uh, in a year. But it doesn't mean that we can uh, sit still until uh, we have those results. So that's why we also presented a plan to. Um, uh, Minister uh, of uh, Infrastructure and uh, and Water uh, and Water uh, tomorrow morning in uh, in the Hague uh, on what we can do uh, meanwhile. So um, very good question is taking place, but the answers uh, are uh, at first in four months. Yeah, and is this a an effort that is being executed jointly with uh, Germany and Belgium? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, we needed. Uh, yeah, we have an uh, agreement on uh, sharing data uh, between uh, uh, the different countries and putting them into um, into the study which uh, uh, we are carrying out with the Inst Institute of uh, Deltares, a large knowledge institute in the Netherlands. Yeah, and I don't know if we're gonna get kicked out in one minute, so I think we have to conclude. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want me to do it, Edgar, or do you want to conclude? No, go ahead, Saskia, please. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much. It's it's time now, so I, I don't know if we are going to kick, kick out. All the speakers, thank you so much. And I think what's very interesting to learn, and there are definitely similarities between Florida and the Netherlands. That's for sure. I hope you reach out to each other um, if you have questions or you want to learn from each other. I think that's very worthwhile. And um, yeah, I think there are some food for thoughts, uh, working together, learning from each other, and again, I think it was very interesting to, to learn and, and hear your enthusiasm in, in all the things that you are doing. So thank you so much. Um, normally, we would, would give you a token of appreciation when we were, would be with each other in person. I hope we can do that in a different occasion. But again, thanks, thanks very much for everything and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. You're welcome.
Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you all. Kunnen wij er nu helemaal uit rooien? Is die nu afgelopen? Ja, je kan er helemaal okay. uit. Waren we op tijd of waren we er al uitgegooid, uh, zeg maar, uh, vanwege de tijd? Nee, had, in principe dan loopt hij nog wel even door. Maar, dus dat was goed gegaan. Dat was goed gegaan, ja. Oké, okay, nou dankjewel. We zullen nog een ja. evaluatie hebben, denk ik. Dat filmpje, dat, dat, dat lukte niet, maar dat kunnen we wel op de website zetten. Ja, ik. Okay. Uh, dat filmpje, dat uh, ja, blijkbaar kon kreeg je geen audio mee nee, in, je de, in je sharing. En dat nee. is met Teams en Zoom ook altijd een probleem. Dus uh, ja, vaag, maar ja, ik kon ja. er niet zoveel meer aan doen. Nou, Sorry. Maar ging de rest wel goed, dus dat is het belangrijkste. Ja, ja, ja. was okay. even haast even van tevoren, maar uh, alles ja. ging goed uiteindelijk. Oké, okay. hey, dankjewel voor alles en uh, ongetwijfeld spreken we yes. later. Hoi hoi. Is goed, hoi hoi. Fijne avond. Jij hebt een fijne dag.